Here's the Egyptian after two days on a camel's back from Egypt. Welcome! Welcome, brother. How was the journey by camel? Not too dangerous, I hope? No, no, thankfully. I see that business is flourishing here, isn't it? Could be better. It could always be better, you know. I don't complain. The elders say that the new market of Jerusalem is rather more lively than the old one. You can make good deals. Here's your money. The Persian clothes and damasks you sent me were sold in just a few days. They were so beautiful, it didn't surprise me at all. Now I have some valuable weapons inlaid with gems and some Persian carpets. I saved them just for you. Let's go and get them. Repent! Repent! Who is that man that keeps shouting like that? That man's name is Haggai. He's a prophet. Repent! 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 Here is the temple. I thought they had already rebuilt it. I didn't know it would take so long. These ruins are painful to behold. The Persian kings, after promising a thousand times, still never gave us any money. Well, maybe... Maybe they don't have any. David and Solomon dominated the world right from this spot. They were great kings of a great people. Have you seen the great temples of the kingdoms of Egypt? Of course I've seen them. They're huge and I've admired the effigies of their divinities. Each to his own, but the Egyptian gods are the most powerful because they're nourished by the Nile. Maybe. But the great gods of Egypt are made of stone, aren't they? Well, what's the difference? Wasn't the god who lived in this temple made of stone? Our god isn't made of stone. You can't sculpt him. He's an invisible but powerful spirit. The creator of heaven and earth, that's what he is. <laughs> what's the use of a god who can't be seen? And what's more, can you explain to me why he didn't save his temple from destruction? Jehovah, the invisible and holy God, had led our people in glory, and he had the kingdoms of David and Solomon. But he got tired of the unfaithfulness of the ungrateful people of Israel, so he delivered them into the hands of their enemies. But the day will come when all the nations will worship Jehovah on Mount Zion. Yes, I'll take that one too. Please, lady, ladies, 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 come and take a look at my wonderful fabric. A city without a temple is an accursed city. Well, where are you going, Haggai? You and your people. It's a hard seeking, my son. We are looking for the devoted children of Jehovah. Take me then. I am surely one of the devoted children of Jehovah, your search is through. No, people like you are not devoted children. If you really are so devoted and really believe in the Almighty, why did you abandon the work on rebuilding the temple? A faithful man doesn't behave like that. Because there was no more money to pay the workers, to buy cedar wood from Lebanon. Everybody knows that. How come you don't know? You abandoned the job because you have no faith. Did you think about your children? What's a nation without a temple? A city without a temple is an accursed 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 city without a temple is an
pray to Jehovah, come all of you to the prince. After Sheshabah, now there's Zerubbabel, but for us, nothing changed, owes us an answer. Where's the money that the Persian king promised us when we were slaves in Babylon? Tell me who took it. Haggai's right. Let's go to the prince, to the prince. Well done, you are the devoted children of Jehovah. You really love him. Let's go. A city without a temple is an accursed That man must be crazy. In the kingdom of Israel, many men like Haggai were born. They seem mad, but they led the children of Israel in the name of Jehovah. A city without a temple is an accursed city. A city without a temple is an accursed city. Dear brothers, the Almighty Lord is saddened. We were not faithful enough to his wise precepts. How can you live peacefully in your homes? while the sacred house of the Lord is still in ruins. Now thus says Jehovah, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but are not filled with drink. You are like a worker who earned his wages and then put them in a bag with holes. And all this because Jehovah's altar is still bare. The candelabra won't burn. What do you want from us, Haggai? Tell us what you want us to do. The Lord says, go up to the mountain and bring food and rebuild my house. In it, I will manifest my glory. This is what the Lord says. My house is laid to waste while each of you is busy building his own. Therefore, the heavens did not let their dewdrops fall upon you. We need the holy temple. When we have it, abundance will return. I say we protest before the governor and ask why the king has abandoned us. Let us go then. It's a curse of the city. city! A city without a temple is an accursed city. A city without a temple is an accursed city. A city without a temple is an accursed city. A city Stop! What do you want? We come to you in the name of Jehovah, Governor. You have nothing to fear. If you are receiving us in peace, then send your guards away. You may leave, guards. These are men of peace. What do you want? We want the victorious Darius, king of Persia, to keep the promise made by his predecessor, Cyrus, when he freed the people of Jerusalem from the slavery of Babylon and we cross the desert again and return to this city. Is it possible that Darius has forgotten this is the city where reigned great David and wise Solomon and that it absolutely cannot die? Doesn't he know he should take care of the city? Even more than Israelis, as it was one of the precious gems which adorn his crown, his reign. Jerusalem won't be able to survive if its heart stops beating. The heart of a city is like the heart of a human being. It's impossible to live without its beating. And its heart, as you know, is the temple. The holy temple, my lord. I didn't forget, no. I will go to Tatnai, the Persian satrap over this land, and I will remind him of the promises made by Darius's predecessors and the throne of Persia to the people of Jerusalem. We will appreciate all you can do. Please have mercy on my poor people and keep your promise, my prince. We will wait for you.
who's that prince with those followers? He looks like a very, very important man. He's Tatnai, the satap who governs in the name of the king, from the Euphrates to Syria and Palestine. Please stand up, Tatna, my dear. Let me see your face. I am at your service, sir. My king, I need an answer. Do speak openly, my faithful satrap. Feel free to ask anything. Divine Darius, I've come to ask you what to do with the Israelis who Cyrus helps return to Jerusalem. What do they ask for, the Israelis? That you confirm the decree made by King Cyrus in their favor. What does that decree say? What was it all about? That the crown would finance the reconstruction of the temple. And why hasn't this decree been done already? Who governs the region there in my name? The Honorable Zerubbabel. Write to him informing him that my wish is that the promises to Cyrus be kept. All the peoples I govern have the right to keep their traditions and the cult of their divinities. Thank you, sir. Because of Darius's order, hundreds of wagons full of precious woods and marbles moved to Jerusalem. Around the rebuilding temple, a city rises up. Years and generations go by. In the new temple, the people worship Jehovah and promise to be faithful to his law. They find their identity again. My compassion for Jerusalem, so Jehovah says. I shall rebuild my house there, because I shall choose Jerusalem as my abode. I'll return unto Zion, and Jerusalem shall be called the City of Truth, the mountain of Jehovah of hosts, the holy mountain. And I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Those are the words of the Almighty dictated to me, and which I pass faithfully on to you. But the people were not able to remain faithful to their God, and the Almighty punished them again. He delivered them into the hands of their enemies once again. In 332 BC, Jerusalem was under the dominion of Alexander the Great, the Macedonian emperor who founded Alexandria in Egypt in 331 BC. Alexander the Great's empire was divided up between two of his generals on his death in 323 BC. Seleucus took over the eastern regions. And Ptolemy took over the western regions. Ptolemy set up his capital in Alexandria and extended his control over Palestine and therefore over Jerusalem. Despite the control of the Macedonian Ptolemy and his descendants, the city with its temple and priestly tradition remained the driving force for Jewish traditions in the vast constellation of Jewish colonies. These were also founded on the Mediterranean's coasts because of the migration of artisans and merchants during the successive phases of invasion and political persecutions, as with the inland cities. The cult of Jehovah continued in these colonies, and the rabbis had synagogues built everywhere. However, the worlds of commerce and power spoke Greek by then, and many Israelites lived in the Greek cities. At the request of Ptolemy the Philadelphus, Ptolemy's the first successor, in about 250 BC in Jerusalem, Eleazar the high priest sent 72 translators to Alexandria. 
These men began a Greek translation of the Jewish people's scriptures, which in full form we know today as the Bible. Their legendary translation is known as the Septuagint, meaning the 70. In 169 BC, King Antiochus IV, the last descendant of Seleucus the Macedonian, battles with Ptolemy VI, the last descendant of the dynasty created in Egypt after the division of Alexander the Great's empire. He decides to attack him because his army has become much stronger than Ptolemy's. Jerusalem is besieged. had suffered under the Ptolemy's dynasty rule for too long and opened the gates of the city in the conviction that they will be well treated by Antiochus. But the situation worsens because Antiochus wants to get his hands not only on the city's commerce but also on the religious cult and traditions of the Israelites. The temple is profane, and the people, feeling even more betrayed, are terrorized into submission. A victorious revolt against King Antiochus explodes, led by the Maccabeans. They are the sons of Matthias the priest, who took the name from their eldest son's nickname, Maccabeus, which means hammer in Jewish. In the following years, they are tormented by struggle and oppression. The land over which David and Solomon had reigned is devastated by factions and armies. But the power of the Roman Republic in the Mediterranean is flourishing in those years. The whole area which formed Alexander's great empire soon becomes a target for expansion for the new power. The means for this expansion is the Romans' powerful military organization, which hinges on its legions, military qualities, and the mobility of a great navy. In 63 BC, Gnaeus Pompeius occupies Palestine, breaks into the temple, destroying it yet again, and plunders the treasury. The Romans extend their control over the whole territory, Hey, stop! We're looking for a well. 
I'm sorry, but without me, I don't think you will be able to find it. What? You will lead us to a well or I will kill you. There's no need to reveal your sword to me, Roman. The worshippers of Jehovah wouldn't deny water to anyone, not even an enemy. Please come with us. Why are you running away from Jerusalem, my friend? Temple of Jehovah has been profaned. The city has been ransacked. I am a goldsmith, and there's nobody left in Jerusalem who can buy my jewels. All the gold I had was stolen. My beloved son who was defending it was killed by a Roman, one just like you. I am sorry, my friend, but it's the war. So where are you thinking of going to live now? I'm going to Antioch. I have a brother who lives there. You see, Roman, the holy hand of Jehovah is upon me, because my family and I have always been obedient to his law. You Romans, you forget one thing. You can destroy Jerusalem, but you can never destroy the people who believe in Jehovah. <laughs> 